V-Spot. I'm your host, Dr. Vix Hater. My co-host is Bill Foster. V-Spot Radio is brought to you by Planet Vix Hater Blog Network. Get everything you need and a few things you truly do not want. Only at Planet Vix Hater. a new intro. I recorded that like a year ago when I knew slightly less than I do now. Okay, we're on the air. We have Jim Cordette, legendary wrestling manager. He's here to talk about the Nashville Comic Con well, part, and uh, old school wrestling, but the Nashville Comic Con is going to be next uh, weekend um, from May 10th to the 12th. It's, uh, yeah, yeah, it's uh, 12th. It's actually the okay. National Comic and Horror Festival. It's going to be at the Hotel Preston, right next to the airport. And uh, and, uh, and we have Jim Cordes to talk with us. Uh, Jim, I want to ask you something before I forget. Okay, well, first of all, thanks for you guys for having me on to uh, to do my shameless plugs. <laughs> oh, don't worry about it. Uh, that's, <laughs> that's what we deal with. Uh, I was watching an old Clash of the Champions from 1989. Uh, you know the one with the NWA tag title tourney? Um, yes, yes, I remember that very well. Okay, you're going to take on the Freebirds, and you're doing a promo, and you're talking, you're saying Bobby and Stan are going to take care of the Freebirds, and you said, I'll take care of anybody on the outside. And I was like, yeah, that's good. And I thought, wait, Terry Gordy's on the outside. What the hell are you going to do to Terry Gordy? Well, see, I, I had a plan. I was going to get stuck in his throat and choke him to death. That's right. You know, I was just thinking, you know, I figured Terry uh, Gordy would be so busy beating on you that uh, he wouldn't have a chance to interfere. No, it, it wouldn't have took him long, but uh, I, I remember that uh, actually very well because we were in Fort Bragg, North Carolina on the uh, Army base there, <laughs> and it was 140 degrees in that building. And I, I actually uh, come, came close to passing out a couple of times. I don't know whether it was from heat frustration or from uh, – Dehydration or what? But it, it was very warm that night. I remember it very well. Yeah, yeah watching the show, it looked like as Jim Rolson and Bob Cottle looked like they were just miserable. I mean, the show—it was a good show, the wrestling wise, but it just looked like it was miserably hot. Oh yeah, they—they they, they looked like they'd had two buckets of water poured over the top of them at ringside. Yeah, that, that's uh, that's one thing we 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 were we were trying to raise money to get them air conditioning in that gym. That's what we were doing. Uh, okay, uh, let me ask you this, because I've been watching uh, the NWA 1988 uh, episodes of World Championship Wrestling, and, you know, it's weird, because this is when I started watching wrestling, and it's amazing. I can't remember nothing from WWF that year, but I can remember watching so many of these episodes as a seven-year-old. And well, one thing that stuck in my head, oh, you can finish. I, I was just going to say, well, that's because those they were good. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, but the one thing stuck in my head, and, you know, I'm watching this, is when you did the straight jacket uh, thing with the Fantastics. Well, yeah, you know, that, that was the uh, Great American Bash of 1988, and we were in Baltimore, and for some unknown reason, uh, the Fantastics claimed that I interfered in the matches. I have no idea. There was never any. That's, that's a matter for the courts to decide. But but for the, the U.S. Tag Team Championship match, they decided not only to put me in a straight jacket, but also to put me in a cage at ringside. So I was in a, in a straight jacket, in a cage, uh, and, 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 and raised up in the air about 20 or 25 feet over the ring. I was, it was very uncomfortable. It was a great vantage point, best seat in the house to watch the match, but I was very uncomfortable. Uh, but it didn't work. It backfired, actually, because, as you'll recall, the Midnight Express did indeed triumph. You know, I watched those matches when because I saw, you know, also the one with J.J. Dillon up in the cage, and I was thinking, you know, because I'm kind of afraid, I'm afraid of heights, and I was thinking I'd be terrified up in one of those. Well, it, it, it wasn't the most comfortable place I've ever been, but see, you know, things like doing things like that in my my youth is why that now I go to these these comic book conventions and horror conventions and just talk to people and sign autographs because it's it's much easier on the body. It's it's not as dangerous. You don't have to be hung from high places. Uh, tied up, held down, and, unless you you know pay to be after the show, that's a different story for another time. 
Uh, it, it's much more comfortable, and, and, and that's why I'm looking forward to coming back to Nashville because usually when I came to Nashville in the 80s, I was, I was getting beat up. And now, I've, hopefully, I'll have a hero's welcome. Well, that depends on which convention you go to. Uh, well, you know, first of all, uh, just uh, I don't know about you guys, but when I heard Don Wells, Mary Ann from Gilligan's Island is going to be there in person now, are you guys, were you ginger guys or were you Mary Ann guys? Oh, Mary Ann. What, what about your co-host? Uh, I'm trying to think. I, I could go either way. We're not asking about your personal life, just whether you enjoyed Ginger or Mary Ann more is, is the question I was posing to you. Uh, the problem was I was mostly watching Bewitched uh, rather than Gilligan's Island, which is a problem. Well, that's so, actually, but... yeah, the, the nose twitch, there's something to be said for that. Actually, the nose twitch was originated in, in Chinese uh, sex manuals back in, in the year 2000 B.C., <laughs> but uh, I, I was always a Dawn Wells, a Mary Ann guy, because to be honest, Ginger looked like she was too expensive, too high maintenance, and Mary Ann was personable, <laughs> energetic, and looked like she'd be happy for it. Yeah, I like there would be gold diggers on that island, island with you. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, Ginger sure was going straight broke. for the bank account. Mary Ann was a farm girl. She could get down and 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 dig in the field, so to speak. So it's basically Betty versus Veronica for you. <laughs> Well, that, well, and once again, Veronica, very high maintenance, used to a high standard of living. Betty would ha- was happy with whatever uh, attention she was paid. I'd have to go with Betty. <laughs> well, you know, I, you know Veronica, Veronica was probably, actually, Veronica probably grew up to be a dominatrix in San Francisco. Whereas I, th- I think Betty Ann, or, or, or uh, I'm sorry, where Betty was, was more, more like, uh, you know, the, the girl next door. <laughs> No, I'm, actually, my first wife was the girl next door. If you if you lived next to a prison, but that's a different story for another time. Uh, let me uh, let me ask you something else about Fantastics. The, th- the thing I was thinking about that I saw on television was when they did the thing where the Fantastics demonstrated the strike jacket, and the Midnight's came out, and they. And I mean, this, I can still remember watching this as a kid because I was upset. I was thinking, what is it? Someone called the police. <laughs> Well, you see, there was a special dispensation. Anything that happened in the uh, TBS broadcast studios was subject to the rules of the National Wrestling Alliance rather than Fulton County Police Department. So we were very fortunate there. But, you know, what did you expect us to do? The idiot put a straitjacket on to demonstrate what I would look like, and so one out of the two of them was was basically immobile, tied up, and defenseless. So we we took that opportunity to, to just show them what we thought about the situation. Well, you know, as an adult, I completely understand, you know. I mean, they were asking for it. They were asking for it. That's, that's, that's always been my defense. Uh, let me ask you, you started wrestling uh, or as a manager in Memphis. Correct, yes. I, I, I actually <laughs> started on Memphis television and, and uh, back in the old days with championship wrestling with Lance Russell and Dave Brown, we were in – Memphis every Monday night, Louisville every Tuesday, Evansville, Indiana every Wednesday, uh, Lexington, Kentucky on Thursdays, and of course, and in Nashville at the fairgrounds there on Saturdays. So uh, for the first oh year, year and two months of my career, I spent uh, my time uh, doing that loop every week. And and uh, it, it, you know, since I'm from Louisville, it was it, it was uh, a whole lot like being at home. Now, growing up a wrestling fan, was there anything when you got into when you got into the business side of wrestling that disappointed you, or or things that exceeded your expectations? Well, ev- everything else exceeded my expectations, except I, I found out that not all wrestlers made hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. So that that was that was kind of disappointing at, at first. Maybe maybe it was just me though. Maybe since I was home, they were just paying me less. But. Uh, but that that's why I enjoyed my time in, in the Tennessee Territory because I got a chance to get some experience and learn. And then I went to Mid-South Wrestling where they actually did pay me hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. So, you know, it, it just took a while. It, it took like a year and a half before I got to that six-figure mark. So I, I, was, I was feeling left out. I saw a video of you uh, managing the Galaxians. Were, who were they under the mask? <laughs> well, the Galax, I don't know if I can reveal this yet, but I guess the statute of limitations and the copyright has run out uh, after 30 years. But the Galaxians were Danny Davis and Ken Wayne, who later went on to greater fame as the Nightmares in the Alabama area. 
Uh, and, of course, then Danny Davis, the same Danny Davis that I was partners with in Ohio Valley Wrestling here in Louisville uh, back about 15 years ago. For, for several years, we operated the WWE Developmental Territory, trained guys like John Cena and Randy Orton, Batista, Victoria, the women's champion, and a whole lot of those other guys. And, and uh, Ken Wayne, of course, was famous as the son of a legendary pro wrestling great Buddy Wayne, who also was a promoter down in Memphis in those days. So... Actually, I had a, I had a great tag team to learn from before I got uh, I got the Midnight Express. Yeah, I was noticing. I thought they might have been the Nightmares, but I figured I could you know just go to the source and ask. Well, you you went right to the horse's mouth, is what you're saying. Yeah. See now, I, I tell you, I, you know, you're starting you're starting now. You see, here's what you're doing. <laughs> you're starting to insult me. I'm a horse's mouth now, but you wanted to say something else. Uh, no, no, believe me. I didn't I'd hate to get my that. tennis racket. You know, I'm bringing the tennis racket to the Nashville Comic and Horror Festival. I'm bringing yeah, what I'd I, hate that. Are you in Nashville? No, I'm in Decatur, Alabama. Ah, well, good thing for you. Well, I, I, and you know, that's never been said before. Good thing for you, you're in Decatur, Alabama. Those words have never been uttered in that order in the English language before. But. <laughs> well, no, no, no. Not Hart, at all. No, Hartville, no, you gotta understand, you can be in Hartville, Alabama. Well, I, actually, you know, I, I stayed uh, I, I stayed at a hotel in in Hartville, Alabama, that uh, one night it was so small they stole my towels. But th- then the next night I stayed in Decatur, and, and the room was so small I had to step outside to change my mind. So you know, the good yeah, thing know. is at the at the hotel Preston in Nashville, the rooms are huge. I understand. And I'm, I'm, I must get my plug in for the folks at Comic City, Tennessee. You, you oh, mentioned it at the top of the program, but. May tenth, eleventh, and twelfth, I'll be at the Hotel Preston in Nashville for the for the Nashville Comic and Horror Festival. We talked about Dawn Wells. I'm going to be there. Sergeant Slaughter is also going to be there. So you got to yeah, be on your best yeah. behavior and make sure to salute. And uh, there's a whole ton of uh, comic book and horror movie guests. And also, I'm, I I would be reticent. I would be uh, pos- positively reticent if I did not mention. That uh, hotel guests, if you if you just come for the day, you you know you get to see the vendors and the dealers and the guests and autographs and all that stuff. But if you stay at the hotel Preston, they got after hours activities. Not that kind. I did check the North American Swing Club is booked at another hotel, but they do have a burlesque show. They've got some horror movie screenings. They've got all kinds of folks in costumes. It's going to be you know a whole big weekend there at the hotel. So I'm I'm checking in. Actually, I may never leave. Uh, let me uh, let me uh, uh, again. I'm really oh, 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 and, and I must. I'm, I'm sorry. I forgot one thing. If you want to know how to go to this this sucker, <laughs> ComicCityTN.com. ComicCityTN.com. We can't stress that enough. ComicCityTN.com. Tickets, information, scheduling, all that type of thing, and, and hopefully some racy pictures of Marianne. Yeah, you know, uh, people that have been around me, I've been talking about this con for about six months now because first I was going because Jim Sterling's going to be there, a, very, a real famous comic book artist. He created Thanos, who's going to be the villain in the next Avengers movie. That's right. Well, Jim Sterling did, did great work with DC Comics for years and years. Yeah, and then I found out Jim Cordette was going to be there, and I was like, oh, man, that, that's even better. And and, 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 they, and then here came, here came Mary Ann. Yeah, and then they said Sergeant Slaughter. At this point, you know, I'm going. Oh, well, that, I'm that, that, you'd rather see Sergeant Slaughter than Mary Ann. So I'm assuming that, you know, you're one of those guys that could go either way, like, you know, like we talked about a minute ago. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Wrestling or Gilligan's I, Island. Either way, you could go there. Yeah, it's like I'm a, I'm a self-proclaimed homosexual. I once violated an NES cartridge. <laughs> I, actually, My longest relationship. Actually, I thought for years I was bisexual until they told me that didn't mean that you paid for it. But, but that's another story for another time as well. Uh, well if you, went, uh, you know, I had a weird encounter one time in a video store. With this, uh, well, with well this now wait, now we're just completely, we're just completely leaving the topics of wrestling and the comic well, art yeah, festival in Nashville. You had a weird encounter at a bookstore. I was talking- yeah, I was talking to this woman. Well, actually, I was talking to a guy, and he knew a woman, and he said that she was. This guy knew a woman. Why? Now wait, now wait a minute. Back up. You're 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 talking 
to a strange man at a bookstore where you had a strange encounter, and he knew a woman. I think I saw this on the news last night. No, no, these things don't happen to me. Uh, there was, but we were looking at wrestling videos, and this like in 2001, and he told me that he knew Dennis Condry's ex-wife. Now, to me, that's a very strange thing to look, because Dennis Condry was a great wrestler, but in 2001, he wasn't exactly, you know, big in the public eye. Well, and, and actually, uh, um, I, and, and, and what city were you in? I was in Huntsville, Huntsville, Alabama. Hmm, well, uh... uh... I don't want to go casting aspersions, but um, uh, Dennis Condry actually, many people know this, was born in Huntsville, Alabama. But Dennis Condry's uh, been married, to my knowledge, twice. And uh, he is currently married, which means he has one ex who I don't think has ever seen Huntsville, Alabama before. <laughs> so maybe, yeah. <laughs> maybe, just maybe... It was one of those Dennis Condry impersonators we hear so much about on the news these days. Yeah, because he was just talking about it, and he said something about, you know, and I, I just wanted to mention this, because he said something about that Condry in 87 just disappeared everywhere. You know, he just fell off the face of the earth, and I was curious to ask you about why he you know, why he left the Midnight Express. Well, actually, that's that's covered in some detail in my, my book, which actually was the Wrestling Observer Book of the Year uh, in 2010, uh, the Midnight Express 25th Anniversary Scrapbook, which is available, which is available autographed copies at jimcornet.com, jimcornet.com. That, once again, is jimcornet.com. Uh, but uh, it was a personal situation, in, in, and uh, while we have not revealed the exact details behind it, uh, I did dispel some of the rumors and uh, some of the uh, the innuendos that had been thrown about, and... Um, he basically decided to take 15 years off from the wrestling business <laughs> and came back uh, a number of years later and looked better than all of us because he had rested his body and, and opened a successful horse stable out in Denver, Colorado, uh, where he uh, boarded, groomed, trained, did all the things you can do with horses. Now watch your dirty mind. And, uh, and, and so he had 15 years less mileage on his body than all the rest of us. Uh, a few weeks ago, I had Thrasher from the Headbangers on the show, and he was telling me that you came up with the Headbanger gimmick. I actually did. Um, uh, when I was operating Smoky Mountain Wrestling in the 90s, uh, my backer, uh, financial backer, was Rick Rubin, the record producer. And uh, the way I'd met him was through a, a good friend of mine who used to be a DJ, had become uh, one of his record promotion men. And he invited. He was in Knoxville one one night and invited me to come down and see the concert uh, that he he was going to in, in terms of his uh, <laughs> his job with Deaf American Records, which was a Danzig uh, uh, concert. Danzig at the time was on Rubens' record label, but the opening act was this weird looking character that came out wearing all these weird clothes and things hanging off of him, and he was wearing a skirt, and he was asking the audience at the count of three to spit on him. And I thought, hmm, there is some type of, of wrestling personality here somewhere from this unheard of no-talent nobody. And so I contacted uh, two guys in New Jersey that had, were pierced and tattooed enough that I thought they could carry it off, and it turned out to be Thrasher and Mosh the Headbangers, who later became the WWF Tag Team Champions. But the obscure artist who has since been forgotten – it was nobody at the time, and opening up that show was some guy named Marilyn Manson. <laughs> so I guess it worked out pretty good for him, too. Yeah, he was telling me that you really hated the Spiders gimmick that they were doing. Well, it wasn't that I, I hated it. It's just that they, they were wearing full-body outfits, kind of, and they were wearing black masks and calling themselves the Spiders, and they had such great expressive faces. And and such, you know, impressive bodies that I didn't think that that should all be covered up. And, I mean, anybody can be the spiders, for heaven's sake. But it takes two guys that look like that to be Thrasher and Mosh the Headbangers. Okay. Uh, what would you consider the Midnight Express's best match? Oh, God, you know, that's like, uh, uh, you know, what was Shakespeare's best play? What was, you know, uh, uh, Hemingway's best novel? Um 
I think, you know, actually one of the greatest matches that I remember uh, uh, was a match with the, the Fantastics in Miami Beach in 1988 <coughs> that was not televised, and another with the Fantastics in Dallas at the Sportatorium in 1985 that was not televised. And by the time we got back to the locker room and the people were screaming and they were throwing the babies in the air, and I said, boy, I wish I had those matches on tape. Uh, but we had so many with the Rock and Roll Express, including uh, – uh, several sellouts of the Charlotte Coliseum matches that were were taped and televised as far away as as uh, Tokyo on Japanese television with the World Pro Wrestling Show in the 80s, which actually I will at the Nashville Comic and Horror Festival have uh, a, a special DVD of all the great Rock and Roll Express Midnight Express matches that Vince McMahon doesn't own stuff from my personal library, so people could could buy that and make their own decisions. I think you're going to be leaving with a good bit of my money. Um, I, my plan is to leave with every bit of your money, just as much as your your last wife's plan was. <laughs> joke, the joke's on you. I've never had a wife. Well, I've I've heard reasons for that also. But... Yeah. Uh, now, uh, I was going to ask you, how do you... Is it, is it true that, that when, when you were in college you couldn't get a date on a tombstone? Oh, no, no. It's like I'm trying to think of something right now. It's like I can't really. It's like I've been, I'm ha- been half out you're, of it. You're, so, like you're, you're so flustered you can't form a cogent simile. I understand. I've I've, I've known the feeling. I was going to ask you, of uh, the people you worked for, uh, who was your favorite booker to work for? You know, actually, um I don't know if I would I would uh, say that uh, he was, at the time was not the booker per se the matchmaker, but uh, I think I learned probably more about professional wrestling from working under Bill Watts, uh, the owner and the promoter of Mid South Wrestling. You know, early in my career, uh, you know, I, I learned a lot in Memphis um, of how to be in the right place at the right time or stay away from being in the wrong place most of the time. But I really learned uh, more about uh, how the, the promotion of wrestling works and and the uh, the ways to hopefully uh, it, it get interest in a big match from uh, from Bill Watts and Dusty Rhodes. Dusty Rhodes too. Yeah, because you know, because in my mind, I always associate the Midnight Express with uh, the NWA. Because when I was, like I said, when I first started watching, you know, that was the one of the big uh, teams. Well, actually, it was. It was our time in Mid South Wrestling for Watts that uh, <laughs> enabled us to come and, and wrestle for the NWA because at the time uh, that uh, Watts chose us in Memphis, Bobby Eaton, Dennis Condry, and myself to come down to his promotion, uh, we were fairly. I was I was a rookie. Uh, Bobby and Dennis uh, had had wrestled for years in the Tennessee area, but had not headlined in, in a major organization. And Watts gave us that opportunity. And by the time that we finished our our run of a year in Mid South Wrestling. They'd had their record business year. We we drew just alone in four shows at the Superdome, over sixty five thousand paid admissions uh, with the Midnight Express in the main event uh, in the year nineteen eighty four. And so as a result, we were kind of able to write our own ticket. And and uh, 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 world class wrestling in Dallas came calling, and so did uh, Crockett Promotions in the Carolinas, the NWA, and we went to world class for six months because it was close, and we were fulfilling some obligations. But uh, we bailed out of there pretty quick and and went to the NWA, where we uh, debuted on TBS in '85 and spent uh, the better part of five and a half years there. How many of the Midnight Express's double teams did they invent? <clears throat> All of them. Why would we do somebody else's stuff when we had so much good stuff of our own? Yeah, because I was looking at a lot of those moves, you know, and they still look good today, you know, and you know, like things like the Vegematic and the uh, much Grey like Pickle. my second wife still looks good today. Um, no, I, I, you know that that's the thing is is that whether it was the combination of Bobby Eaton and Dennis Condry or Bobby Eaton and Stan Lane, uh, we always tried to play to their strengths and make their double-team maneuvers uh, a combination of two things that individually both guys did well. And so if you'll notice, there were things that Stan took the uh, the aggressive part of, and, and Bobby was the uh, setup guy, and there were things that were the other way around because we took advantage of both of their individual strengths, and we just combined them. 
uh, Brian Pillman, the late Brian Pillman, said one time that wrestling the Midnight Express was like being in the ring with a bunch of air traffic controllers. They were shouting instructions and code at each other that only the three of us knew what the meaning of was. And if you just kind of stood in the middle and let them uh, revolve around you, uh, nobody got hurt. Uh, I was going to ask you about this, uh, about because you were mentioning earlier how you wished you had had some of these matches on tape. And, you know, I know Smokey Mountain, there was, there's a lot of fan cams. And, you know, ECW taped all their shows. Do you know why the bigger companies wouldn't just take a video camera and film their house shows? I mean, it couldn't cost that much. Well, you have to remember that uh, until the mid-'80s, there was really no home video market for wrestling. And also, you have to remember that every major promotion, of which there were some two dozen across the country, ran a six- and seven-night-a-week schedule. So literally, there was, uh, with the expense of professional broadcast quality tape in those days, there was no reason to tape every event that took place every night of the week because uh, there would never be uh, enough television, <laughs> we didn't think at that time, to enough television outlets to air all this. Uh, at the time, most big markets had four or five television stations. And uh, so then when home video came in in the late 80s uh, uh, for wrestling in a big way, uh, that's when things started being taped a lot more often. But the early stuff up until about 1988, uh, it was television and pay-per-view and, and a few uh, you know one-camera shoots in the major arenas. And otherwise, now a lot of that stuff uh, never was, was recorded. Yeah, but fortunately, I, in my in my infinitely successful and borderline wise way, uh, actually did have a friend of mine uh, uh, shoot some uh, World Tag Team title matches in places like Philadelphia and Charlotte, etc., with the Road Warriors, the Rock and Roll Express, Dusty Rhodes, and Magnum TA, which is actually on that uh, aforementioned DVD that I will have for sale at the Nashville Comic and Horror Convention, uh, May 10th, 11th, and 12th at Hotel Preston in Nashville, right near the airport. For tickets and information, ComicCityTN.com, Don Wells, Mary Ann, Sergeant Slaughter, myself, uh, burlesque shows, movie screenings, nearly naked women, and alcohol will be available on the premises uh, at the hotel bar. Uh, now, as an expert on tag team wrestling, and you know you were in the NWA at the time, uh, who would you say was the better team, the Gladiators or the Cruel Connection? You know, I've got to say the Cruel Connection, just because they were they were really connected and they were very cruel. Um, you know, I had to top the Gladiators, but I was always a fan of the Mulkies, Randy and Bill Mulkey, Mulkey Mania, a team that will live in infamy. They took a classic ass whipping. As a matter of fact, the Midnight Express versus the Mulkey Brothers for the United States Tag Team Championship still has the all-time attendance record uh, for pro wrestling in the city of Anderson, South Carolina, which actually, coincidentally, was the Mulkey's hometown. Yeah, you know, you watch that match, I, was, I was watching that match the other day with the Gladiators and the Mulkeys, and the Gladiators almost struck me as a tragic story. You know, they were coming in you know, ready to take on the world, and then they lost that one match and they could never regain their momentum. They never got the big mo back. I'll agree with you there. All right. Uh, now, uh, later on, you were mentioning uh, singles. Right now, I remember, okay, you brought in Big Bubba Rogers as your bodyguard, and later, you know, Jim Crockett bought the UWF, and Bubba won the UWF title, but he wasn't managed by you. He was managed by Skandor Agbar. Well, you know that's what right. that was? We, we, well, see, we were based in Charlotte uh, with Jim Crockett Promotions, but when they purchased the UWF from Bill Watts, <laughs> that office was based in Dallas, and they were running events, uh, you know, five, six, seven nights a week, just as Crockett Promotions was. So since the Midnight Express were more established and more valuable in the Charlotte end of the uh, of the uh, NWA. Uh, it was decided that uh, that there would be certain uh, talents on the roster that would be sent down to Dallas and fulfill those obligations. And and Big Bubba, as, as at the time, he was starting to become quite a, a, a pretty prominent singles wrestler, so he went down there and needed a manager there. And, you know, as great as I am, I can't be in two places at once. The only regret I have in my life is that I was not born twins because then I could have shared my greatness with twice as many people at the same time, but... So I, ha I had to I had to bite the bullet and sell his contract to Akbar. All right. Uh, you 
know why Bubba left the NWA at the, when he did? I'm sorry, say it again. Do you know why Bubba left the NWA when he did for the WWF? Oh, uh, actually, he, uh, uh, you know, Hulk Hogan had heard about him and said, hey, here's this guy that's uh, 6'7 and 350 pounds and, and is a, uh, a pretty daggum good wrestler, and I believe I can make some money on pay-per-view with him. And uh, Vince McMahon gave him a big offer, and he went to uh, Madison Square Garden to fight Hulk Hogan. So it, it, was a, it was a financial decision of which he came out on the better end of. Uh, yeah, because we're, uh, you know, my little nephew, you know, they watch wrestling with me, you know, and they mainly, I mainly just watch old wrestling, and the little one's uh, four years old, and he loves Bubba. He he just goes around singing the Big Boss Man song. It was a catchy tune. It really was. <laughs> and then he tried to pick up a stick and hit his brother with it, and I had to stop him. But uh, I tell you what, guys, I am going to have to uh, to – Bid adieu at this time because I just got a phone call, which I did not answer, from my wife expecting me to pick her up and take her to a wonderful dinner tonight. So unless either of you guys knows a good divorce attorney, um, I'm afraid my time is coming to a close. All right. Well, thank you very much for uh, appearing on the show. and We really appreciate it. And once again, uh, the Nashville Comic and Horror Con at the Preston Hotel, and I can't remember that website but well i'll tell you i'll tell you what i'll do it for you and i want to thank you guys very much for having me on i've had fun i kid with you i just kid i'm you know i'm really a, a friend of furry woodland creatures but uh i'm i'm encouraged to see all the the wrestling fans the comic fans the horror fans all down may 10th through 12th at the hotel preston in nashville you can go to comiccitytn.com for information uh my Cornets Collectibles booth will be there all weekend. I've got wrestling memorabilia. I've got my books and videos. I've got some great, because I've been a lifelong comic book collector and, and a horror movie fan also, so I've got some great uh, comic-related merchandise and some rare wrestling uh, uh, memorabilia from the 70s uh, from Nashville that I'm going to be bringing down, fans of Jerry Lawler and Bill Dundee and Dutch Mantel and the fabulous ones, Jackie Fargo, guys like that. Come on down. i got a little something for everybody. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you, too, because I'm going to make sure, I'm going to make sure, Victor, that you come that night and that you get an autographed Midnight Express scrapbook. All you got to do is come up and show your, your driver's license, and it's complimentary if that is indeed your oh. real name. Oh, man. Thank you. I've been wanting that book for uh, so long now, and I was planning on Well, I've, I know that because friends of yours have told me that you're just too cheap to buy it, so I guess I'll just have to give it to you so you can experience the greatness of it. But, uh, but you know, most most folks have told me that Victor is actually so cheap, cheap he will pinch a nickel until the buffalo farts. I never believed it until now. Oh, oh it's true. And the younger folks in the audience, look, Google that one, and you'll figure it out, why that's such a funny line. Uh, well, I'll let you go pick up your wife now. <laughs> uh, you, you have a great day. Guys, thank you very much. I'll see you in Nashville, May 10th through the 12th.